Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. If you watched my last video on the Sorensen power supply teardown, I mentioned that the power supply was a phase angle controlled or phase uh, fired type power supply, and I promised that I would uh, elaborate on that more. So today we're going to talk about triacs. A triac is a kind of a complex a semiconductor device. It has a whole bunch of layers. It's actually f uh, more than uh, four or five. It's quite intricate. And this is the schematic symbol for what a triac looks like. A triac is most commonly looked at as two uh, SCRs, which is a silicon controlled uh, rectifier or a thyristor, those terms are more or less interchangeable, with the uh, gates of the two SCRs tied together. And if you can kind of tell, that's where we get the uh, schematic symbol for the triac, where you have your, the two SCRs side by side with a single gate as the output. The easiest way to explain how a triac works is by using the SCR model. The way an SCR works is when you have a voltage applied, let's say we're talking about uh, this left one, when you have a voltage applied where there is a positive voltage here and uh, the negative side of it here, that's the, the difference of potential across the uh, uh, SCR. Uh, the uh, addition of a uh, uh, voltage signal to the gate will then trigger the SCR and the SCR will conduct in this direction. Then, uh, if the, uh, uh, on this right one, the uh, polarity of the voltage applied across it looks like this and you uh, trigger the gate, then the uh, SCR will conduct this way. And you might ask yourself, how is that useful? And that's useful specifically for AC type applications. Something that uh, I want to make sure and mention, and I kind of forgot to do it a second ago, so I want to uh, do it now uh, in its own uh, little clip uh, per se, is that with both SCRs and triacs, something to remember is that once the uh, SCR is triggered, and current begins to flow through the SCR, the S there's no way to shut off the SCR until the current through it drops to, let's just say, zero. It's actually, there's some small value that it has to get below, but for the sake of argument, let's just say zero because it makes it a little easier to understand. So, once current begins to flow, the current will continue to flow up until the current drops to zero, and at that point, uh, the SCR would, will shut off. And the triac effectively works in the same kind of manner. When current begins, to, after the trigger obviously, when current begins to flow, the triac will not shut off up until the current drops to zero. Now here's the reason why a triac is so damn useful for AC. Uh, we've all seen the characteristic voltage uh, waveform for AC, at least I hope you have. But uh, what I want to demonstrate effectively by drawing this is the fact that at these points here, here, and here, the current effectively drops to zero. And what you get is the ability to be able to, to shut off a triac at any one of these zero crossings, as they're usually referred to, because the voltage crosses zero at these points. And so, for instance, using a triac as a switch makes it fairly convenient because the on resistance of a triac is fairly low, same with SCRs. So you can uh, turn a triac on and it'll continue to conduct and then you can turn the triac off and even if you do it somewhere in the middle of the, uh, you know, once you stop applying the trigger to the gate, even if you stop applying the trigger to the gate somewhere in the middle of the waveform, you're always guaranteed for the waveform to be able to cross the zero point and that's when the triac will shut off. Before we start, uh, 
discussing drawing whatever circuits for triax something that we need to make sure uh, everyone understands are the terminals of the triac and even though the triac is bidirectional the terminals actually matter quite a bit the terminal that's on the same side as the gate is m t1 the terminal that's on the other side of the gate is m t2 and the gate is as i've been referring to it the whole time is the gate Now what I've drawn here is a very basic uh, a triac circuit. What we have here is we have the AC coming in here, you have the hot and neutral. The hot goes to, let's just say, a light bulb because that makes it nice and easy. And then down to the triac and back over to the neutral. When the switch is open, the gate is not being uh, energized and the triac is off. When you close the switch, uh, and this is how you trigger a triac, the gate on the positive wave uh, must go more positive than uh, the MT1 terminal. And on the negative wave, which, you know, on this positive wave, the uh, MT1 terminal needs to go more positive. And on the negative wave, the uh, MT1 terminal needs, uh, sorry, the gate needs to be more negative than the MT1 terminal to properly uh, trigger the triac. And in this case, as you can see, the MT1 terminal is tied to neutral and the gate is now tied to the hot side. And so you get the proper triggering during each phase of the uh, AC wave. And uh, this works as a basic switch. When you close this switch, the light bulb turns on. When you open the switch, the light bulb turns off. The way to improve the circuit slightly is if we add a resistor down to the neutral side. And what this resistor will do is that it will uh, make sure that the triac does not inadvertently trigger uh, from spikes in the AC wave and just general noise, etc., uh, when the switch is open, because when the switch is open, the gate is floating, and uh, a floating terminal on a, a silicon device is generally a bad idea. So you would tie this down to the neutral side to make sure that spikes and whatnot do not cause the gate to go above the polarity of the, or above or below the polarity of the MT1 terminal. Now, while the switch circuit is all fine and dandy, you could effectively do it with a big button, you know, big set of contacts, et cetera, instead of having using, uh, instead of using a triac. Where the triac uh, really uh, shows its uh, colors is in a dimming circuit. This circuit here is a basic light bulb dimmer. How does it work? The gate of the triac is hooked up to something called a diac. A diac is in, actually in the same family as the triac, but the one major difference between the diac and the triac is the diac doesn't actually have a gate pin. The way a diac works kind of resembles a Zener diode, where with a Zener diode, you apply a, a voltage to it and you gradually increase that voltage. And once you exceed uh, the uh, preset voltage of the Zener diode, the Zener diode begins to conduct. The uh, one different, the, the biggest difference, I guess, between the diac and a Zener diode is that one uh, with a Zener diode, you have to continue to exceed the uh, voltage uh, past, uh, you know, the little, uh, just for uh, instance, let's say it's a, a five volt Zener. You have to exceed five volts to get the Zener diode to conduct and you have to stay above that five volts with a diac which actually has kind of an interesting uh, IV uh, characteristic curve is you get to the breakdown voltage of the diac but as soon as the diac starts to conduct that uh, voltage collapses down to some low level and the diac will continue to flow current. The reason why this is important for this kind of triac circuit is because uh, the diac is going to help us chop up the AC waveform. 
And uh, the uh, diac here is hooked up to a capacitor and a variable resistor. You can use a potentiometer or something along those lines. And the variable resistor and capacitor help us uh, generate a phase shift, which is then uh, assisted by the diac to chop up the AC waveform. Let's take a look at uh, how this whole thing works together. To try and explain how uh, the triac and diac and this whole uh, dimmer type setup works, I'm going to draw what the waveform is going to look like with the uh, triac in place here. The idea is because of the uh, resistor and capacitor here, uh, you get a phase shift, meaning that uh, the uh, waveform of the voltage out here across the bulb and across the uh, uh, triac is going to end up lagging because of the RC constant between the resistor and capacitor. Furthermore, uh, the diac, which usually has like a 30 volt uh, a breakdown voltage, uh, Im improves the uh, that phase shifts even further because as this waveform, as the AC over here is climbing, let's say we're right here on the waveform, the uh, resistor is charging up the capacitor and so the voltage at this point here by the diac is climbing slower. Because the voltage here at the diac is climbing slower, what you end up seeing is that uh, the uh, the waveform now, instead of coming up this way because of the triac, it's just flatlined. And I'm going to represent that with the uh, red marker here. Once you actually reach the point of the diac conducting and the triac uh, firing, the, the waveform here will now jump up like this. And the reason why it's called chopping up an AC waveform is you kind of took a notch out of that AC waveform. And so as soon as the triac fires, the triac is now fully conducting and the waveform here is going to continue to follow the uh, normal AC waveform. But when you reach the point of zero crossing, this spot right here, the triac shuts off again and now what happens is the uh, that uh, waveform will now again uh, not conduct and you uh, eventually hit a spot where it will conduct and it will continue to conduct all the way to the end and this process repeats itself over and over and over again. The reason why this works as a dimmer is because you're taking a little notch out of the AC waveforms, you're effectively providing less energy or less RMS voltage or however you want to look at to the light bulb and the light bulb will now start to dim. So um, let's do it in, let's do this one in green. As you adjust the knob to give you even more dimming, uh, this notch here will start to travel this way. So now the way it will look like, you know, let's say we really cranked on the knob. You'll have nothing, 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 nothing. And finally the uh, voltage will jump up and then come down this way and come down this way down to here. And then again over here, you'll get nothing, 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 nothing. And then it will conduct and then come down this way. You can see that you can, by using the setup, you can really get this angle, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, notch over to the right to really, really, really dim this bulb. This type of circuit is reasonably well suited to drive a purely resistive load, such as a heater or light bulb. Where the circuit uh, begins to break down is if you try to drive a motor with it. The reason for this is a motor is an inductive type load and the motor will make the voltage and current uh, not be in sync anymore. Generally, the current lags the voltage with an inductive load. And so because of that, you could have a condition where the triac uh, falsely triggers. The reason for this is that, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, current uh, through the triac has to effectively drop to zero. 
and uh, we're guaranteed that it will because of the AC waveform. But because the voltage is no longer in sync with the uh, uh, current, what you end up getting is as the voltage drops to zero, I'm sorry, as the current drops to zero, the voltage across the triac isn't also zero at the same time. And so the triac could effectively act inadvertently false trigger and uh, begin to conduct again. And so to prevent this, uh, this circuit uh, to be able to drive like a single phase induction motor or like a uh, universal uh, wound motor, something like that, or even if uh, you uh, rectify this and drive a DC motor with it, the triac needs something called a snubber. A snubber is a circuit that usually is a resistor and capacitor that sits in parallel across the triac. What the snubber does is it helps to uh, redirect some of the current around the triac around the time that the uh, AC voltage crosses uh, the zero point and that allows the uh, triac to shut off. Now you might be wondering after we've discussed everything that we've discussed uh, on how do I control a triac with let's say a new Arduino project that I'm working on or something like that. You know, how do I get a uh, microcontroller to control a triac? Hey, I'll just tie the microcontroller to the gate of the uh, triac. And there are some triacs that can accept a logic level input to be able to trigger them, but don't. <laughs> because uh, when you're dealing with uh, AC mains, it's very easy to uh, blow something up or even uh, hurt yourself. And so when uh, dealing with a triac and um, something low voltage microcontroller, etc., you always want to use isolation. And in this case, they make a device that's specifically designed to drive a triac and isolate you from it. And in this case, this is a, uh, a, a photo isolator. Uh, a, uh, an optocoupler is another way of putting it. The way it works is the optocoupler contains two things. It contains a little baby triac, so uh, a device that can conduct in both directions, you know, yay, that's exactly what we're looking for, and it contains an LED, and this whole thing is sitting in a package where the triac and LED can actually see each other. And I just realized that I forgot to uh, put a uh, resistor in here because you always want a resistor in circuits like this. But how, uh, how does this work? The idea is that there is a separation. The two devices inside the optocoupler are separated by some amount and uh, very smart people figure out that, you know, several th it takes several thousand volts uh, for a arc to jump from one side to the other, the way the package designed, etc. But I don't know if you've ever wondered why uh, all semiconductor type stuff are generally in a black plastic case. There are some white ones and there are some different colors, but the reason for this is that uh, uh, silicon type electronics are very sensitive to light. And so in an optocoupler, the LED over here provides the light, it provides the photons to shower the other device, the triac in this case, and when the triac gets showered with photons, it gets energized and it turns on. So the uh, the LED effectively turns on the triac. So in a circuit like this, uh, this circuit would effectively work as an on-off switch. Uh, by uh, When you turn the light on, the triac turns on, which then turns on the big boy triac. And when the LED turns off, the uh, little baby triac turns off, and the main big daddy triac also turns off. Now you might wonder, um, let's say we have a circuit like this and we want to uh, drive it with uh, a microcontroller as I described, but we want to do this uh, waveform uh, chopping thing to be able to dim lights or turn on, uh, you know, to change the speed of motors, etc. How 
uh, would you accomplish that? Well, unfortunately for a microcontroller to be able to do this kind of chopping action is a little more complicated because the microcontroller needs to be able to detect the zero crossings. That's these points right here. And then to be able to uh, calculate how much time needs to pass from, let's say, this point to the turn on point uh, to then uh, trigger the triac and uh, for a smaller micro it's actually fairly labor intensive and you have to do it with uh, interrupts etc because uh, you know it takes fairly precise timing to be able to uh, uh, time yourself to the grid like this uh, and if you uh, just do it once and then assume a, a time uh, further on or what you can get is drift and all kinds of weird things happen so uh, to be able to drive uh, a triac for speed controlled mode you need a, uh, a zero crossing detector what the zero crossing detector will do is it'll, it'll give you some sort of pulse either every time uh, the waveform crosses zero or in some sort of specific fashion whether you know it crosses zero on the positive edge or crosses zero on the negative edge etc that uh, zero crossing is detected by uh, an interrupt and that interrupt will then uh, inside of it uh, do the calculation. You know, it, it's usually fairly simple addition or subtraction depending on how you design it. And then uh, you can load a time into a timer and then exit the interrupt. Uh, by loading a time into the timer, the timer will count down and as the timer uh, counts down that's the uh, gap here from uh, the zero crossing to where you want to fire and uh, when the time hits zero the uh, another interrupt for the timer fires and inside that interrupt you turn on the led and trigger the triad and then you effectively afterwards wait till the next zero crossing and it's uh, a, a lather rinse repeat just kind of over and over and over again and so you have to be aware of uh, timing when you're doing programs uh, whilst running the uh, <clears throat> uh, the setup if you're using interrupts to do it uh, you can do other operations in the meantime if you choose not to use interrupts uh, you could inadvertently uh, bog down the program and you could how would you put uh, you could accidentally fire the triac either not enough or too much because of the way the program interacts with the waveform. Now something that I want to mention, and this is good to know information, uh, is uh, with triacs, triacs generally describe their operation in quadrants. So you can have like a two quadrant triac, a three quadrant triac, a four quadrant triac. I don't think uh, I don't think I've heard of like a one quadrant triac. So the, what are the quadrants and what does that uh, mean? The quadrants are the quarters of the AC waveform. So if I take this AC waveform and I cut it up into quarters like that, <clears throat> uh, the beginning of the positive wave here is quadrant one and they usually use Roman numerals to describe them. The end of the positive wave was quadrant two. I guess that would be easier. Uh, the beginning of the negative wave is quadrant three. And the end of the negative wave is then quadrant four. And if anybody ever tells you that four is four dashes is way wrong, Four is uh, one before the V, which is uh, five minus one, which gives you four. But anyway, <clears throat> so the a two quadrant triac will generally be able to will well, not generally will be able to function in quadrant one and quadrant three. That means that uh, you can trigger the triac reliably. Uh, all the way up to the middle of the waveform. If you try to trigger a two quadrant triac somewhere in quadrant two or quadrant four, it may not work. So then a three quadrant triac, uh, similar kind of idea. 
it will work in quadrant one, quadrant two, and quadrant three, but not necessarily quadrant four. Again, it won't be reliable. So if you're looking uh, to only partially chop up the AC waveform, as long as you stay away from the halfway mark on either side, a two or three quadrant triac will work perfectly for you. Uh, if you want to be able to, let's say, dim a light bulb to very, very low levels, you really need a four quadrant triac because you're going to be chopping the AC waveform deep into quadrant two and quadrant four. Triacs are uh, fairly complex devices, particularly in the way you control them and needing a snubber and setting them up and getting them to work properly and reliably. So what I've done here is I've given you a basic tutor tutorial on triax, uh, and again I want to mention that whenever you're dealing with AC mains, be very very careful <clears throat> because you can hurt or kill yourself. Yay. Uh, there are some more subtleties about triax that I think are outside of this purview uh, of this video because all I'm trying to do is get you started in triax. You know, this is a introduction to triax. Um, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to I'll leave it in the comments section down below. And thank you for watching.